Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode in my Tennis Ball Machine build series. I am a bit disappointed to say that this might be the final installment for a while. My goal from the start was to create a tennis ball machine using readily available parts. As you know, I managed to pull this off with the ball feeder module using items bought from my local hardware store. But the ball launcher module has been a different story altogether. It demanded a level of precision that I haven't been able to achieve using off-the-shelf parts. The core challenge was connecting three key components, the wheel, the axle, and the motor shaft. I experimented with three different designs, but unfortunately every attempt had an issue either with alignment or balance or both, and ultimately they all fell short. My first attempt was a straightforward inline design where everything was supposed to be perfectly aligned. However, there was a bit of play between the shaft coupler and the threaded rod. Even though they were supposed to be 10 millimeters in specification, there was a slight discrepancy in their sizes. Next, I tried a belt and pulley system hoping to address the alignment issue, but I underestimated the importance of belt length. To fit a tennis ball snugly between the wheels, the belts needed to be perfectly sized, which proved to be impossible to purchase online. My third and final attempt was similar to the first, but I used a different type of shaft coupler that I had to order in from China. The problem this time was with the wheel itself. I couldn't find a wheel with the exact bore size, so I had to modify it which caused it to become unbalanced. As a result, the entire assembly would excessively vibrate when the motor reached its full speed. And if I know anything about engineering, vibrations to machines are like Crip9 to Superman. Ah, I'm really bummed about this because I know many of you were excited to see this project through to completion. The truth is I've hit a roadblock that requires more advanced tools and skills that I currently possess to overcome. So, I'm gonna take a step back and explore options like working with a machinist or experimenting with 3D printed parts. And if I manage to overcome these challenges and build a machine, I'll definitely share the results with you. But for now, I need a break. I'm gonna focus on making videos on other interesting topics and focus on growing this channel, but Oh, there's always a but. I believe there's still value in sharing the knowledge I've gained. And some of uh, you have already requested for this. So I'm going to open source my code in a hope that you or others out there might use it for your own projects, whether it is for school or a hobby or anything else, really. I've included a link to the code in the description, so feel free to download it. I don't know about you, but explaining over 2000 lines of code in a video would be incredibly boring and tediously long. So I'll focus on the core concepts in this video. All right, I'm excited, are you? Let's break down the main components and see how the code handles them. First up is the radio remote. I'm using one button on this remote to start and stop the machine. In the code, I refer to this button as RFD2. When you press it, pin 43 receives a signal. The signal is stored in a variable called RADREMA. If a mode is currently active, I check the previous value of RADREM A. If it was 1, I set it to 0, meaning you want to pause the machine. If it was 0, I set it to 1, indicating you want to start or resume the machine. If no mode is active, I set RADREM A to 0 and do nothing. Essentially, this module captures my intention based on the machine's current state. Next is the IR remote, which works in a similar way. We use pin 49 to receive IR signals and employ several variables for different modes and functions. For instance, sweep mode is linked to the power button on the IR remote. When decoded, the signal for sweep mode button is number 69. I have a variable called IR REM 169, which stands for IR remote's first button with a decoded value of 69 that stores one or zero just like the radio remote button. So a value of one means you've selected sweep mode and zero means you've deselected it. I also have a variable called IR program active that becomes one when any mode is active. This helps determine if the machine is operating or idle. 
Moving on to functions, let's see how to adjust speed using the IR remote button. The other functions like spin, frequency and sweep follow similar logic. Um, there are two buttons visually represented as 0 and 1 on the remote, but their decoded values are 22 and 12. I have a variable called IR rem speed 2212 to store the speed value. If I receive an IR signal with a value of 22, it means I want to increase the speed. So I increment the variable by 1. Conversely, if I receive a signal value of 12, I decrease the value by 1. However, if the value reaches 10, I do nothing and display maximum speed. On the other hand, if it reaches 1, I do nothing and display minimum speed. That's how you interact with the machine using the IR and radio remotes. The next component is the limit switch or ball feed sensor as I call it in the code. This is straightforward. When the limit switch is pressed, pin 35 receives a signal indicating a ball has been released and is about to launch. I set a variable to 1 when this happens, but only if the horizontal and the vertical motors are stationary. This prevents interference with ongoing commands. Imagine the sweep motor is moving to a target position and if a ball drops during that motion, the limit switch gets pressed, but I do nothing because the sweep motor hasn't finished its task. This keeps things simple and prevents confusion. Are you still with me? All right, let's dive deeper and look at how we calculate motor speeds. First, let's examine the ball feed motor speed, the one that spins the disc to release the balls from the container. I use the frequency variable linked to the IR remote to directly determine the motor speed. Speed is represented as a value between 0 and 255, where 0 means stopped and 255 means full speed. Here's a table showing the mapping. Next, let's see how we calculate the speed for the upper and the lower motors, or BTMU and BTML. To determine their speeds, I use two variables set by the IR remote buttons speed and spin. The following table shows how these variables affect the upper and the lower motor speeds. Essentially, if the spin value is greater than zero, the upper motor should be faster than the lower motor and vice versa if the spin is less than zero. Since these motors rotate in opposite directions, we need to account for that by assigning a negative value as well. We're almost there. Now, for the tricky part, controlling the horizontal and the vertical motors. Unlike other motors, the sweep and the elevation motors don't run continuously. They need to move to a specific position and stop. That's why I use gear motors with rotary encoders. Now, I could have used stepper motors, which would have probably simplified the logic, but I went with gear motors uh, with rotary encoders for their high torque ratings. A rotary encoder generates a fixed number of steps for each full rotation of the motor shaft and using the signals we can also determine the direction. In my case I have calculated these uh, to be 75 steps per 7 degrees or for each successive sweep motion. First we need to capture the signals from the encoders. I refer to sweep motor as the horizontal motor and its encoder signals are connected to pins 18 and 28. Using the digital read function, I employ two variables per motor to store the current and the continuous encoder step values. This graphic illustrates the concept. You'll also notice that the HSM position variable is reset whenever it reaches the target position while HSM continuous position variable is never reset. Look, to simplify this explanation, I'll focus on the sweep or the HSM motor, as the vertical motor operates similarly. The horizontal motor has five positions, negative two, negative one, zero, one, and two. The goal is to move the motor to these positions sequentially each time a signal is received from the ball feed sensor. Initially, the horizontal motor is always at position zero and we start by moving from 0 to 1. If the sweep mode is selected, indicated by the sweep mode variable being 1, and the radio remote is also activated, I check if the sweep motor is stopped. I determine this by examining the HSM position variable, which is reset to 0 only when the motor reaches its target position. I then check if the current position is 2, 
and set a variable to indicate it's the maximum position. Similarly, if it is negative two, I set a variable for minimum position. Next, I check the ball feed sensor variable. Um, a value of one indicates a ball is ready to launch. So I calculate the target step value and store it in HSM val variable. This table displays the target values, which are initially constant, but will become dynamic later in the program. I also update the sweep variable to track the next sweep position. Now, let's revisit the HSM position and the HSM continuous position variables. I want to set the step value to be dynamic when the target sweep positions are 2, negative 2 and 0 for better control. Using absolute values could lead to errors and I want position 2 and negative 2 to consistently land the balls in the corner of the court and position 0 should land the ball at the center of the court. Remember, position 0 also serves to return the machine to the default position when we're done playing. Therefore, I recalculate the target step whenever the motor is in current position of 1 or negative 1 because the target positions can only be 2 or 0 and negative 2 or 0 respectively. This table shows these calculations. I use HSM continuous position variable to determine the actual position and with the help of few constants, I derive the dynamic step value for positions 2 and negative 2. Position 0 is simply the negative of the HSM continuous position variable. Once we have the target step value stored in HSM value variable, we need to actually move the motor. This is where PID control comes into play. Look, I know this is a lot of information and I've simplified things as much as possible. But if you want to dive deeper into encoders and PID control, I've included some helpful links in the description. Go check it out. Without going into excessive detail, PID control involves sending power to the motor, measuring the movement from the rotary encoders, and using that feedback to adjust the power. This is repeated until the target position is reached. This graphic shows how the motor power is calculated using the variables we discussed. KP, KI, and KD are constants that can be fine-tuned for optimal results. You'll find these values in the code. A positive PID output moves the motor clockwise and a negative PID output moves it counterclockwise and a value of zero indicates the motor should be stopped as it has reached its target position. Finally, this diagram encompasses the entire sweep mode's operation. I use simple LCD commands to display the mode and function values like speed, spin and provide feedback when the mode is not selected. Well, there you go. We got through it. The other modes have their own logic, but they largely follow the same principles we covered in the sweep mode. I really hope this explanation was helpful. If you found it interesting, please like and consider subscribing. Once again, I'm sorry to shell this project for now, but I'll be back with more videos. I'll be exploring different topics, possibly tangential to what I've been doing, but I'm hoping you will like it. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.